Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Is this on? Is it on? Yeah, it's on. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Hi. Um, my name is Christiana Ochoa. I'm the Dean for Research and Faculty Affairs here at the Maurer School of Law, and it is my pleasure and also my privilege to get to introduce uh, Professor Hendrik Hartog this afternoon. Our Dean, Dean Parrish, is unfortunately not here and unable to make it and sends his deep regrets for that. Um, I, I want to welcome our colleagues from across the campus uh, for making the trip over, and obviously also my own colleagues here at the law school. I think uh, seeing us here as a group is such a great testament to what has become a truly interdisciplinary campus and law school, and so it's really nice to have everybody here in the room together, and I'm sure it will make for a fruitful discussion after Professor Hartog's lecture. I also really want to thank our students for being here. It's such a, uh, a demonstration of your interest in furthering your legal education beyond what we're able to offer as a group of uh, faculty members here together um, every day. And it's one of the reasons that we have these terrific lectures and we're really grateful to have you here. I wanna extend just two other thanks that are incredibly important. One is, of course, to Chelsea Browning who makes these events uh, possible. She does you know, really, truly, actually everything to make them possible. So thank you to Chelsea. And obviously, um, thank you to Professor Hartog who I will introduce further in just a minute, but I wanna alert you all to the fact that he's not just delivering our hall lecture today, but he is also going to be um, uh, uh, sharing with us his current work as part of our speaker series for the Center for Law, Society, and Culture tomorrow afternoon at 4 p.m. on the third floor upstairs in the faculty conference room, and you're all welcome to come. It's surely gonna be an interesting discussion. Um, so before I get to the introduction of, of Professor Hartog, I would like to tell you a little bit about Professor Jerome Hall, after whom this lecture is named. Jerome Hall was a pioneer of interdisciplinary analysis and legal problems, and in that way, inviting Professor Hartog to give this lecture today is uh, really perfect. He was a graduate of the University of Chicago Law School, and he was a member of the Indiana Law School faculty from 1939 to 1970. During his long and distinguished career, Professor Hall brought his astonishing breadth of knowledge, not just to hundreds of IU students uh, who were grateful to have him, uh, but also to the rest of the world. He was asked by the US State Department to assist in the reconstruction of Korea's legal system in 1954, and that led to his being later named um, an honorary director of the Korean Legal Institute. And he lectured in Japan, Taiwan, the Philippines, and India. As a Fulbright Scholar, he lectured at the University of London and Queen's uh, University in Belfast. And as a Ford Foundation lecturer, he spoke in Mexico and South America. His books and articles uh, were uh, important when he published them and they have continued to have currency and they continue to be cited in the most important legal journals in the United States and internationally. Indeed, his books and his articles were translated into Japanese, Korean, German, French, and Portuguese. Here at the law school, we honor his scholarship and his legacy through our Jerome Hall's Fellow Program in the Center for Law, Society, and Culture. And we also all know, in fact, the students probably best know Professor Hall's name because it graces our beautiful library. Thanks to the generous gift in 2015 from Lowell Bear, which resulted from Lowell Bear's naming of this entire building. Uh, uh, Lowell Bear had been Jerome Hall's uh, research assistant while he was a student here, and he wanted to honor Professor Hall's legacy and asked that the library be named after Professor Hall. In 1994, the law school inaugurated the Hall Lecture, which has been given every other year since that time. In the inaugural remarks that the then Dean, Fred Amen, who I, I hope is here, is here. Thank you, hi Fred. Um, uh, he revealed uh, that Professor Hall was not happy in his career as a practitioner before he became an academic. And he sought the advice of none other than Clarence Darrow, who advised him to, quote, swim with the current and do only what he found interesting. And he did, and he joined us here at IU and became one of our uh, most important professors. Uh, Darrow, Darrow's advice changed the course of Hall's life, and we are all better for it. Today, we're all better for it because his legacy gives us a chance uh, to gather together to welcome Professor Hendrik Hartog. 
Dirk Hartog is the class of 1921 Bicentennial Professor in History of American Law and Liberty at Princeton University. For a decade, he was the director of Princeton's Uni Princeton University's program in American Studies. Before his time at Princeton, he taught at the Univers University of Wisconsin Law School, and he started his career here at our own law school, where he taught from 1977 to 1982. We welcome you home, and I know you have colleagues, friends, and even former students in this room who are delighted to see you. Professor Hartog has been awarded a variety of national fellowships and lectureships, and for a decade he co-edited Studies in Legal History, the book series of the American Society of Legal History. In 2016, he was made an honorary fellow of the American Society of Legal History. Professor Hartog's own webpage states, that he has spent his scholarly life obsessed with the difficulties and opportunities that come with studying how broad political and cultural themes have been expressed in everyday legal conflicts. He has worked in a variety of areas of American legal history, on the history of city life, on the history of constitutional rights claims, on the history of marriage, on the history of slavery and emancipation, and on the historiography of legal change and le legal history itself. He is the author of so many important works of legal history that I won't be able to name them all. And of course, they've been published in the most enviable of, of journals and academic presses. What I'd like to highlight for you is just a few of the titles of those publications because they help us get a sense of the tremendous scholarly journal, journey that Professor Hartog has been on during his illustrious career. It is a career that has been both inclusive and expansive and has pushed the boundaries indeed opened whole new fields of exploration within the field of legal history. Here are some of those titles. Public Property and Private Power, The Corporation of the City of New York in American Law from 1730 to 1870. Someday, all this will be yours. A history of inheritance in old age. Lawyering, Husband's Rights and the Unwritten Law in 19th Century America. Man and Wife in America. A history. Abigail Bailey's coverture, law in a married woman's consciousness. One can imagine spending hours poring over not just these titles, but in fact the whole list of Professor Hartog's uh, 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 work that make up the body of his scholarly career. Today we get to do a little bit of reveling in that career together, uh, and we're so grateful to have him here to share with us his most recent book, The Trouble with Minna, A Case of Slavery and Emancipation in the Antebellum North. Please join me in welcoming Professor Hartog. Thank you so much, uh, Dean Ochoa, for that introduction. Um, and, and let me just thank you know, her and the Dean Parrish, Jessica Eaglin, who started this ball, to Chelsea Brown Browning, and to my dear friend, Michael Grossberg, um, who um, we started graduate school together now, how many years is it, 46 years ago? It's foggy. <laughs> it's foggy. <laughs> it is. And to others who've made this trip possible. I should say, just quickly to do an introduction, I, that coming back to Bloomington is always poignant and complicated for me. I made friendships here that lasted. I learned sort of to teach students, law students. My first year property uh, law evaluations were a disaster. One student wrote that I was a nice person, but he or she was going to write the governor to have me fired. <laughs> I didn't know if that was possible or not. Um, I would walk into Val Nolan's office, about whom somebody here should write a biography, um, seeking answers to questions I knew would come from students, and he kindly and patiently answered them, while little Junkos, because he was a great ornithologist, peeped in paper bags on his desk. Um, one other story um, I just thought. Um, Lauren Robel, the provost, is she here? Is she the um, uh, uh, prov what? I know she's, okay. Provost Robel, as a first year student, by my third year, I thought I understood how to teach property law. And I had this wonderful um, outline for a class, you know, and I would take students carefully from one 
misperception about whatever the subject was to the next, to the next, to the next, and finish with a grand finale. And I had this wonderfully organized. And then I called on this first year student, Lauren Robel, who thought about the question for me. It was the first time I had cold called her. And she said, well, you move from one, two, three, four, <laughs> five, six. The whole class in 15 seconds, she had solved everything. And I had nothing left to say. <laughs> She was clearly, and you know, she was, you know, smarter than, than I could possibly be. And I had to sit there and shuffle on and try and figure out how to get on with the rest of the class. I wrote my dissertation while teaching property law and taking my kids to Suzuki violin classes and to soccer games at Bryant Park and to the children's theater at the library that my wife and two friends had started. I am deeply marked by my years at Indiana, more so perhaps than from anywhere else I lived in my adulthood. And I think for the most part, in happy ways. True as well of others in my family. My son, now 46, remembers living on University Street as a totally idyllic time with he and his friends free to ride their big wheels down the middle of the street with the freedom by the time he was seven to bicycle to the library. And the campus was and is so very beautiful. I never knew Jerome Hall. I, I don't think I ever even was in a, in a space, even though, uh, time with him. But he was still a presence when I arrived. And ironically, my former student, Sarah Seo, presently at University of Iowa, has just finished a long Yale Law Journal piece about him and the Cold War, so, which connects to the themes you were talking about. Um, but this is a talk about New Jersey. <laughs> as far as the history of slavery and emancipation go, there are incredible similarities between Indiana and New Jersey. And somebody should tell, tell the story of slavery in Indiana, which is, I don't think has actually been told. Both had more complicated relationships to slavery than the historiography conventionally tells or told until books like mine began to appear. Both had histories that belies our conventional division of America in the pre-Civil War era as divided between an enslaved South and a free North. In this talk, I want to illustrate the complications by reading from a couple of passages from the book. One about the early legal life of Joseph Hornblower, who was um, probably the only abolitionist chief justice in, in any state court in America, and he was the Chief Justice of the New Jersey Supreme Court. And I want to conclude by focusing on the material I dealt with um, as a way to illustrate some perennial problems in the law of contract, not you, what you might think of as connected to slavery, but deeply connected. Um, so something for the law students. I hope you enjoy it. Um, I should say as a kind of preliminary, I had thought of using this time to tell you about several of the stories that lie at the heart of this book. They're good stories about arson and escapes, about abandonment and care, um, about kidnappings and poor relief and family reconstructions. And those stories allowed me to begin to see the features of an odd but curiously familiar world, one in which my actors, white and black, legally trained and illiterate, constantly and for the most part competently negotiated contradictory norms and rules, both with one another and with the agents of that peculiar place, New Jersey. But I fear to suck you into too many weed fields. <laughs> and for those of you who will, I hope, want to read the book, it's short and I think accessible. The weeds are fragrant and digestible and nutritious. <laughs> I don't want to rob you of the surprises that those stories hold. OK, so part one. I wrote this book to answer questions or mysteries I couldn't let hold of. Or to put it differently, it emerged out of a series of accidents and fortunate conjunctures. One story led to another and to another. And although this book is framed around one central story, the 1840 case of Force v. Haynes, the content and the meanings of that story are shaped by hundreds of other stories found as I traced a variety of leads. Meanwhile, the answers to the mysteries I found and explored about New Jersey and gradual emancipation 
among other things, still remain mysterious and incomplete. Several years ago, I was researching and writing a book about care within middling, mostly white families. There was a phrase I kept finding in the cases I was using as my primary sources. Whenever a court wanted to deny compensation for what some young person had done to care for an older relative, it would declare that the actions constituted a mere voluntary courtesy. Even if a daughter or niece had spent years cleaning bedpans and doing all the work that came with the care of a demented old person, when she finally sued for some compensation, she might be turned but down by a judge who mobilized that phrase, a mere voluntary courtesy. Where did that phrase come from? Weirdly enough, when I looked, I discovered it came from an 1840 New Jersey case, Force v. Haynes, about an older white woman who sued the apparent master of an apparently enslaved, and the apparent, you have to sort of hold the apparent into the story, apparently enslaved black woman to recover the costs of the enslaved woman's care. The enslaved woman had once been the leased property of the older white woman, as almost always is the case, there was actually a longer history to the phrase reaching back to a 17th century English case about a man seeking a pardon for his conviction for murder, but that's another story, and let me leave that aside. Anyway, finding Force v. Haynes and Justice Ford's elaborate opinion about what made the care of the apparently enslaved Minna a mere voluntary courtesy introduced me to the world of slavery in New Jersey. Care was part of the story, but between reading Ford's and the other concurring or dissenting opinions by the justices of the New Jersey Supreme Court, and there, every judge wrote an elaborate opinion, so it's one of these sort of repositories of competing understandings, um, I found myself suddenly absorbed by the questions that New Jersey slavery raised for them, or in some crucial moments that they ignored. In those opinions, they argued over the meaning and the moral significance of the law of slavery, all to explain why Mrs. Haynes, the white woman, could not get the compensation she had asked for. What were they arguing about at a time when the number of slaves in New Jersey was already minuscule? These opinions led me into the question of what was gradual emancipation in the North. New Jersey, not a representative state. I actually don't believe in the idea of representative states, but less different from other new northern states than one might think, or than some historians have claimed, had enacted a gradual emancipation law in 1804. What that meant was that the children of enslaved people from then on would become free when or if they reached the age of 21 if female or 25 if male. Um, you have to understand this is basically a way of getting in, um, kind of much of the life labor of these people out of, um, out of them before they become free. Um, there's a famous article by the economic historians Fogel and Eggerman which called this emancipation at bargain basement prices. And it was basically, that's what it really was. Although the numbers of enslaved people in the state as a result of gradual emancipation, because the older people died and the newer people would eventually become free or disappear or be shipped to Louisiana where they would go uh, because of the declining prices which made them valuable. Um, but the number of, of, of enslaved people in the state declined steadily so that by 1840, at the time of Force v. Haynes, there were around 600 slaves left in the state. As late as the Civil War, though, there were still a few women and men who were effectively enslaved, although by then the state identified them as apprentices for life, though the U.S. Census called them slaves. <laughs> Let me just emphasize that the census was more accurate than the New Jersey uh, state legislature. And since the New Jersey legislature voted down the 13th Amendment in 1865, one might imagine that it never ended. Um, there is a recent literature about slavery in the North which emphasizes how long emancipation took, why it was that apparently free states remained slave states well into the 19th century. 
This recent literature reacts to and challenges an older historiography that celebrated the creation of a free North after the American Revolution. My questions and the sort of problem that Force v. Haynes raised led me into an approach that was different than those that characterized either of those two literatures, either the um, optimistic free North cre is created or the it's bad all the way, it stays slavery all the way literature. I became absorbed by the question of what it meant that people, white and black, continued to live within a regime of gradual emancipation for the better part of two generations, over a period roughly as long as the period from the end of World War II to the present day, to 2019. What were the legal terms that shaped their ongoing relationships and their evolving understandings? How did gradual emancipation unfold legally? I became interested in what gradual emancipation was other than as a lead up to an ending. I began to see gradual emancipation as a regime, a chaotic and contradictory but recognizable state system of legal and governmental rules and practices. Boundaries, both physical and conceptual boundaries, were constantly being crossed, including the boundaries that separated New Jersey from the laws of other states. But boundaries are crossed in every legal regime. Gradual emancipation was more than a transition. It was a way of being a legal regime. So I dived into the law of New Jersey, bracketing off the question whether it was really a free or really a slave state. Indeed, I came to see gradual emancipation as both. As I mentioned, I found many good stories along the way. There was pervasive contracting between masters and their slaves. I'll say something about the meanings of those contracting contracts at the end of the talk. Yet some of the contracting had the effect of preserving the institution of slavery even as the usual effects of contracting were in the end to in turn enslave people into free peoples. But the in the end could be a very, very long time. And the New Jersey regime was enmeshed with uncertain relationships with poor relief, with other forms of labor relations, with uncertainties about the jurisdiction of New York courts over particular individuals who might or might not belong in or to the state, with deep uncertainties about what was the law. As such, I came to see what I was doing as a challenge to what might be called the neo-abolitionism that shapes our constitutional consciousness and culture as American citizens. What do I mean by that? I mean that I work to think outside of a conventional wisdom, one that I, like most Americans, share today. I came to see that our understanding of the relationship between slavery and freedom one that is fixed in our lives by the Reconstruction Amendments and by birthright citizenship can blinker us to previous historical understandings. The meaning of freedom, our understanding of freedom, one that is deeply imbricated in our constitutional culture, one that is instantiated and made manifest by the 13th Amendment, one that draws on both anti-slavery abolitionist thinking and late antebellum pro-slavery thought begins with the truth that slavery and freedom exist in antinomic relationship to one another. One is free or one is enslaved. We live in a world of slavery or we live in a world of freedom. To understand freedom is to understand not slavery, which is emblazoned in the 13th Amendment's badges and incidents of slavery. Just as slavery is the antithesis of the terms of life in the free world we live in. And yet throughout most of human history, at least up to the Civil War, slavery did not end with an exemplary and absolutist act. Indeed, unless one imagines the Civil War as the, or the Union Army actually as the actor, it may never have ended in that way, even with the passage of the 13th Amendment. Throughout most of modern history, putting aside the Haitian Revolution, and even the Haitian Revolution is a more complicated story than it's often told, Including the end of slavery in New Jersey, slavery's end was always experienced as gradual and incomplete, as about systems of compensation and about transitions, about family relations and about the management and the costs of dependency. Often, as in New Jersey, it became governmentally a question of taxation. In that sense, the trouble with Minna explores the excluded middle that our constitutional conventional wisdom makes invisible today. 
It is, to use a phrase that I draw from the title of my mentor, Willard Hurst's most famous book, about law and the conditions of freedom, but ironically or paradoxically, it is about conditions of freedom that existed in a world of gradual emancipation, where people lived lives, sometimes long lived lives, in a space and an era where freedom and slavery coexisted. As such, it may have something to teach us about the conditions that shape our lives as well today. Okay, that's part one. Part two, I'm gonna read a little bit from the, from the work. Uh, what were the terms of that world? How were lives lived within that regime? The book is my answer, but here's a taste. Consider the early legal life of Joseph Hornblower, the Chief Justice of the New Jersey Supreme Court, and one of two judges who dissented in Force v. Haynes. Um, after his death in 1862, his biographers and memorialists all celebrated his anti-slavery credentials. He had, they said, always been an anti-slavery man who did, quote, his best to extinguish the last remnants of the slavery institution which lingered in some portions of his state. In 1836, he had challenged the enforceability in New Jersey of the Federal Fugitive Slave Act. In 1844, as a member of the convention convened to draft a new state constitution, he argued strenuously but unsuccessfully for an absolute abolition of slavery. In 1845, in one of the first decisions under that constitution, he argued that the opening constitutional statement of rights in that document made slavery an impossibility. Once again, though, he argued as a dissenter without success. In 1857, as an old man, he wrote a young admirer that he despaired for his country because of the power that slaveholders wielded nationally. Okay, earlier, however, as a family member and a young lawyer, he had lived and practiced law within New Jersey's regime of slavery and very gradual emancipation. How comfortably he lived within that regime, it is impossible to say. But we have to assume that he managed to reconcile his work life and his household and family life with his principles, even as he maintained his membership in manumission societies. He knew how to be a slaveholder, at least a New Jersey slaveholder, and he understood and worked within the terms of New Jersey law. In 1823, he and his siblings manumitted a slave. Manumitted means free, just as for, to assume that people don't have to know that. Um, Sarah, identified as having been their father's slave. Josiah Hornblower, Joseph's father, had died in 1809, 14 years earlier. After his death, the inventory to his estate for which Joseph served as executor had included five enslaved people, two men each worth $200, one man worth $120, a quote unquote Negro girl worth $50, and a second girl named Sal who was worth only $20. I suspect that Sal was the same woman that Joseph Hornblower and his brothers manumitted 14 years later as Sarah. But where had she lived between Josiah's death and her manumission? Presumably, the slaves Josiah Hornblower had possessed at his death had either been sold or more likely had been distributed among his four children with appropriate accounting and set off. Thus, it is possible that she lived as a slave in Joseph Hornblower's household. In his will, Josiah Hornblower, a controversial engineer and inventor, had instructed his executors that he wished his slave Betty to be freed if she obtained the necessary security for legal manumission. Betty did not appear in the inventory to his estate, either because Josiah's instructions removed her from the inventory um, or because she was of no marketable value due to her age. She was probably over 40, which is why her manumission was premised on payment of security to protect the town's overseers of the poor from responsibility. If she could not find such security, she would, according to Josiah's will, be free to choose her own master, it's a very weird concept, and should be sold for a reasonable compensation. It is, of course, significant that Josiah did not suggest or dictate that his executors should pay for her security, um, and we know nothing about how Josiah expected that Betty would find the resources to buy her freedom. Since Betty's name does not appear 
with or without security in the Essex County manumission book, it is likely that she found a new master for herself. One is left to wonder whom she chose and how she made that decision, and also what, if anything, the estate received from the master um, she chose. In 1817 and 1818, Joseph Hornblower, who lived in Newark, manumitted his own slaves, a woman, Molly, and a man, Benjamin. Obviously, those acts require us to conclude that up until that point, well into his adulthood, he had kept slaves in his own household. Joseph Hornblower, now we'll talk about his practice. Joseph Hornblower had been a successful lawyer for a quarter century by the time he became the Chief Justice of the New Jersey Supreme Court in 1832. Indeed, in his biographical survey of New Jersey judges, Lucius Elmer argued that Hornblower had been a better lawyer than a judge, that his temperament was better suited to advocacy. Like most successful lawyers of the time, his practice was a combination of trial advocacy and office counsel. In 1813, one of Hornblower's clients was Anne Ogilvy. Her father, Alexander McWhorter, had been a famous minister in Elizabethtown in South Carolina. McWhorter had died in 1807, and Anne was his executor. Hornblower had been hired to help her settle her father's estate and work through other matters. Early on, that involved dealing with the death of Katie, Anne Ogilvy's quote-unquote black woman. A letter from Ogilvy noted that Katie's death agitated and affected her exceedingly. It was the loss of someone who had acted a conspicuous part among my beloved father's household, and it brought tender remembrances into view. By 1813, Katie evidently lived on her own, quote unquote, under the hill, apart from Ogilvy, although apparently not freed. With her death, rent was still owed, and her clothing and her chests and her bed, bedstead, and rubbish had to be removed and sold. Would Hornblower deal with that sort of typical lawyer thing that lawyers would get asked to do um, since Ogilvy was just a fatherless, brotherless, childless widow? This is the sort of plaintive, romantic, sentimental side of it. He, who looked to the sympathy and kindness in his heart. Hornblower noted on the back of the letter that he had spent $20 on Ogilvy's behalf, including $2.25 for Katie's remaining rent and $6 for a coffin. In December 1813, Samuel Beebe of New York City, a grandson of McWhorter and a nephew of Ann Ogilvy, sent attorney Hornblower a note. A black girl, I'll stop doing the quotations because this is a kind of pervasive youth uh, uh, form and you, you can read the quotations into my, 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 son, my speech, who had once belonged to his grandfather, had called on him because she had been told that Hornblower intended to have her sold as part of his management of the McWhorter estate. Remember, this is an abolitionist judge. Um, B.B. wanted Hornblower to know that was not possible. Ann Ogilvy had given the black girl called Leah or Elsie, she's variously named in various documents, to his sister Mary, who lived with their parents in New York City. According to Beebe, she had spent several years in the Beebe household, but recently Mary Beebe had told her that if she thought she could procure a living, she might leave her and be free. As a result, according to Beebe, Leah or Elsie could not be sold because she was no longer a slave. Beebe hoped that Hornblower would drop him a line on the subject. If Hornblower did respond, the letter is lost. And the next we hear of Leah or Elsie is more than eight years later in January 1822. Hornblower received a letter from Theodorus Bailey, a New York attorney and politician, who enclosed an opinion letter from another New York attorney, the eminent Josiah Ogden Hoffman, with regard to the status of a female slave of the late Dr. McWhorter. The costs of her care, usually referred to as maintenance, were being litigated between the overseers of the poor of the township of Newark, New Jersey, and the McWhorter estate. Evidently, Leah or Leah or Elsie had moved to Newark after Mary Beebe had released her from service, become a pauper, and applied for poor relief. Under New Jersey law, as expressed in the 1798 slave code, a slave owner might remain liable for the care of his or her now dependent slave, even after having manumitted, that is, freed the slave. It looks like Hornblower, who 
had written to Bailey to ask him to solicit Hoffman's opinion about the legal status of a slave like Leah or Elsie under New York law, because he couldn't figure out whether it's New York law or New Jersey law. That's relevant. Um, he looked to Hoffman for an authoritative answer. Hoffman's short one paragraph opinion letter was written in a telegraphic lawyer's code, the things that you all are learning to interpret and make sense of, um, that would have been understood by a sophisticated colleague like Hornblower. <coughs> Took me weeks to figure it out. One, on the other hand, it probably needs deciphering and expansion for any other human being. His first point was that New York law forbade the importation of slaves. When Mary B, because New York was far ahead of New Jersey on the emancipation front, when Mary Beebe brought Leah or Elsie from New Jersey into New York, which is not, of course, what actually happened, Leah or Elsie became ipso facto free because that is what New York law prescribed as punishment for slave owners who violated New York law by moving slaves into the state. They lost their property. Hoffman's second point was that the gift of Leah or Elsie from Anne Ogilvy to Mary Beebe was valid, even though there was nothing in writing. An oral gift of personal chattel was valid, unlike real estate whose validity depended on the presence of a written contract. Since the gift was a valid one, it constituted a complete transfer of the McWhorter estate's interest in Leah or Elsie. Thus, even though Mary Beebe gained nothing from the gift from her aunt because Leah or Elsie had become free as a result of the attempt to move her into New, Jer New York as a slave, the McWhorter estate retained no rights to Leah or Elsie. This also meant that the aunt's estate, which Hornblower was now managing, had no duties toward Leah or Elsie or to the overseers of the poor and should not have to pay the Newark overseers for her care. Hoffman's third point, since the slave became free in New York and so lived as free, not just when Mary told her she was free, but from the moment she came into the state, it may well be questioned whether her subsequent return to New Jersey restored her to slavery. A manumission by force of law should have the same effect as an actual and effectual formal deed or de uh, uh, act or deed of manumission. In either case, the result would be a full emancipation. Hoffman did not believe that jurisdictions had the power to reimpose slavery on those who had once become free. Hornblower must have sent Hoffman's letter on to the new work overseers of the poor. Evidently, it didn't convince them. In March, Hornblower re um, received notification that the overseers were applying for a court order to require the heirs and executors of the Reverend Alexander McWhorter to provide for the support and maintenance of Elsie, a black girl aged about 30 years, the slave and property of the de said deceased at the time of his death and now a pauper. The story goes on, it goes on and on and on, and it ends up, as historical stories often do, without any, um, un, you know, we, we can't know did the estate pay or did it not pay? You know, it just disappears. Documents disappear. So let me stop. And let me now read a little bit from the introduction. Um, as, as this should show you, this is throughout a study of contractual behavior. To talk legalish, I'm in a law school, so why not? Um, one might describe this as a book about questions regarding the law of consideration as it would have been understood in the legal culture of the early 19th century. Through the lens of care and enslavement, it explores how particular acts, expressions, and transactions did or did not produce legally enforceable duties and obligations, and how other acts, expressions, and transactions became the consideration for an enforceable contract. The reader's attention will be drawn to agreements and bargains suggested and implied and challenged. Such writings were constitutive of a contractual world, even when mobilized to produce the material conditions we identify with chattel slavery. So just to take a couple of examples, um, uh, Consider the provisions in many wills that promise to free or manumit an enslaved person at the end of a fixed term. If you work for me for six years more, then I will free you. Um, or to take another example that will be explored in chapter three, 
the writing coercively imposed by a ferry owner on his black employee to recreate a condition of slavery, at least for a limited term. Or to take a third example, which I spent a lot of time on, which I still think is a mystery, Rebecca Scott, who is a great historian at Michigan, and I have been sort of exploring this, the fraudulent letters, but a, a um, one of the sort of obligations that New Jersey law passes is you can't move your slave out of state without the slave's permission, consent. Now, what consent meant for a slave is a, is a mystery, but, um, and then there is this judge, Judge Van Wickle in Middlesex County, who has, who has a son who owns a Louisiana plantation, who in one day, uh, produces 150 uh, free consent forms by uh, uh, slaves agreeing to go work in the sugar fields of Louisiana. Now, no sane person would ever sign that, uh, but they, they, there are 150 of them suddenly produced. Now, you know, we know that has to be fraudulent. There was no consent. Um, but it is all about contract, right? I mean, they're stuck within a world of contract law and they can't think their way outside of it. Usually those contracts expressed a slaveholder's power. Um, and yet they also extended a present relationship into a defined and bounded future as contracts between free individuals are expected to do. They produced what poet and scholar of the ancient world, Anne Carson calls a now. Each represented a limited but real effort to control the future, to thrust a present relationship and now into the future. Each carried the implication that the relationship in question, even one called slavery, would come to an end at the conclusion of the contracted four term, a fixed and finite period of time. And once the contract was executed in some fantasy or re sometimes reality, Everyone, including the apparently enslaved, could walk away. Such writings, deeds, wills, bills of sale, and scraps of paper, along with the legal arguments over their meaning, produce much of the documentary record that underlies this study. I've struggled to interpret conflicted meanings in the contractual language and, and in legal arguments and trial testimony in order to reconstruct the terms of the New Jersey slave regime and determine what gradual abolition meant in practice for the enslaved, for slaveholders, and for the communities that surrounded them. As is the goal of many historians, my goal is to reveal how lives were lived within those relationships in order to gain and share a fleeting insight into those people's present tense, there now. For many abolitionists, Southern slaveholders and historians alike, slavery has implicitly meant a denial of the fugitive and fleeting but delimited now of contract. Instead, the law of slavery has been said to be founded on the belief that a property law writing, a deed for example, could fix an identity in perpetuity. Indeed, our confident sense of the moral illegitimacy of chattel slavery, learned from abolitionists among others, is enmeshed with its apparent denial of the boundaries that contractualism offers. That is much of what is captured by the familiar trope that slavery privileged property and denied personhood. And it was a standard understanding throughout the Deep South that contracting was inconsistent with the condition of being enslaved. So no Southern jurisdiction could have passed a kind of in consent law of the sort that you see in New Jersey. By contrast, between the early 19th century and the 1840s, one finds negotiated and temporally bound slave relationships throughout New Jersey. These were relationships that incorporated a particularized and fleeting now, a temporality that one ordinarily identifies with contractual freedom. As late as the 1840s, New Jersey continued to allow a few white women and men to know themselves as slaveholders at the same time, 1840s New Jersey had a legal culture shaped by contractualism and ubiquitous contracting. That's the apparent paradox at the heart of the study. Um, I, I think I'm gonna stop at this point so that there's enough time because I don't wanna, I, I have more I can read, but I think this should, so I mean, you get a sense of what the problems are and, and, and the, the sort of conceptual issues that really drew me 
into this project and made it just full of incredibly interesting stories. Anyway, thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to questions. Thank you. Yes. I looked and I saw, I saw that. Was, it was Except for <laughs> so, so I'm not a lawyer, I'm not trained in legal history, so this is a non-specialist question. Um, as I understood it, you're showing us a kind of distinction between sort of a contractual identity and a um, sort of ontological identity, and you're saying that sort of instead of understanding freedom as an ontological state, it was a contractual state? Is that in this peculiar? Okay, so. Okay, so that was actually what I was going to ask about is, is the law ever thinking ontologically? I mean, does it, when it comes to persons? surprising that it is constantly at the mercy um, of its impoverishment. So I don't want to make this into a nicer world. <laughs> American South, I'm most familiar with the American South and the history surrounding slavery there. Do slaveholders ever give up cleanly, right? Um, because if you think about the South, in, in ways you could describe a similar, uh, a situation similar to New Jersey, convict lease systems, all yeah, sorts of things like that. Right, right, but 
you know, long after Reconstruction, uh, right? I mean, it's a complicated story about the South. And first of all, you have to separate different parts of the South. Virginia comes within one vote of enacting gradual emancipation in 1799. Um, and it looks for a long States in part because of the effects of its semi-gradual emancipation in the uh, early 19th century. Um, you know, there is no full, I, I, one could mess up the story in all sorts of ways. All through the South, they have the problem of poor relief and old age care as well. Um, now, it is fed, the fantasy So this is just a fascinating story, thank you. Um, and in particular, of course, the, the sort of the large outlines of the story are all about the ways in which this sort of gradual emancipation served the interests of slaveholders and of government. Um, and what I'm wondering is, I, I know nothing about the law of slavery anywhere, really, except to the extent that I've taught property to. <laughs> um, um, and so the picture of persons as property is strikingly different from the picture you're describing, where they're understood to have the capacity to contract. And I understand that giving them that capacity was largely done in the interests of their masters, former masters, and governments. But did it have any effect on the actual relationship? Stand here. Yeah, okay, I promise. I'm sorry. I don't want to screw. screw up. Yeah. Um, obviously, it did. You know, but it's from story to story. You know, you have to look from story to story. I mean, I tell the story. You know, a long story in the middle of the book about an arson case. Um, this is about a judge in New Jersey who uh, gets a pioneering insurance. Um, a uh, fire insurance policy from a New York policy, uh, and then um, gets his slave to burn down the house. Um, now, the, the, the slave um, will, in the end, get free, will, in the end, um, because he's holding on to a piece of paper which basically promised his freedom in exchange for the fire. Now, uh, so, so, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, it's an awesome story in part because you, you know, you have to sort of, I mean, I, I would sort of like to write a novel about it because what I don't know, you know, you have to imagine how he, he you can see the stages of his negotiations. He knows if he gets caught burning down 
this topic. He's going to be burned to death himself or hung. That, that's uh, slaves burning um, as arsonists is one of the recurrent fantasies of the slaveholder world. So he's <coughs> sitting there, you know, he's saying no, and then he's saying, but maybe if you include my children and my wife, maybe if you do, I mean, you can watch him as a very, very smart negotiator, even though at all points the risk to him must have been enormous. Um, but he eventually, you know, he, he pulls it off. So that's a story of somebody who actually, you know, and it's all about holding on to this piece of paper. He hands the insurance company the piece of paper, and their lawyers then run with it and, and tell the story. So it's, you know, you could also tell us uh, just a story about capitalism, and, you know, and, uh, w which it is as well. Um, and there's a lot, I mean, part of the the mystery of the story is sometimes in the seven or already in the early 1790s, I, I've gone sort of thoroughly through private papers involving enslaved people in the Princeton Library and all through several several different. And suddenly in the 1790s, you see term limits being put into all sorts of deeds involving enslaved people. Now, that's not happening by accident. And I assume that, you know, it, you know, and some of that has to be do, you know, why did the enslaved people? Because there was a large free black communities in both New York and in Philadelphia. It's remarked, and once there's, uh, you know, and there's regular ferry traffic, and it's really easy to get there and then disappear into, uh, into a, a community that you won't know. So, I mean, I assume that the knowledge of that leads slaveholders to realize they've got to get what they can uh, you know with uh, in, in a in a limited situation uh, first thank you so much for such an interesting um lecture i'm going to ask you a question coming at your lecture and at your to which enslaved people know what they're negotiating about. So, I mean, there's a kind of central problem in the story, in, 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 in all these cases, about poor relief and about can you, and, and basically the, the, the law says you can't, well, it says a lot, of, it, it, it's so complicated, to, to get a, it out as a sentence is difficult, but let me try. Um, you can't simply manumit a slave who's turned 40. Because at that point, they be, they're likely to be dependent. You all don't understand this, but 
in that world, 40 is old and mostly worn out and uh, unlikely and understood as not like, as likely to be dependent. And looking at it from the vantage point of 70, it doesn't <laughs> seem so, <laughs> but, but it's, um, but it looked, but so, 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 and you can see enslaved people in the deeds negotiating around that 40 year old thing. They know, they know there's a problem at that point um, in the story. Um, the other, you know, the other thing is just once there's a steamboat to New York, it's so easy to disappear. So, I mean, you know, there's this one case about some boy who, who is sold for a wagon. And there's the, it's basically a dispute about consideration of the wagon for the value of the wagon against the value of the boy, who is not a slave, it turns out. But, the, but nobody's sure about that because the, the, the chain of title is, is confused. But at some point, there's one, one of the two litigants, sort of, they're neighbors. And you can sort of imagine that the road in the middle between them, and they're not getting along, needless to say, at this point. And one neighbor goes with, I think, some other men to pick up the wagon to take it back because the slave. And, um, and then the boy, who is, not, you know, who is not a slave, he's just a boy, he's a 15-year-old, um, is brought to the middle of the road, supposedly, to go back. And you can just imagine him looking this way that way, and he walks that direction, you know, and, and, and he disappears from the story, and, you know, and I, I assume he walked to the nearest steamboat and got on the ferry and uh, was in, in New York. So. so that's an amazing story for you to end with, and I, it's one o'clock and I want to make sure that people can get off to yeah. the next things, but um, I welcome you to stay and talk sure. about it with Professor Partog and remind you of his workshop tomorrow at 4 o'clock in our uh, faculty conference room upstairs. Uh, thank you so, so much.